this recording on from here. Um, we'll kind of go through the first couple of steps of our buyer presentation. And one of the things that, you know, I want to point out as we go through this presentation, you know, today is here we have a five-step home buying process. If you wanted to make this a seven-step home buying process, you could. If you wanted to make it a three-step home buying process, you could. All right. If you like even numbers and you want to make it a four-step, you could do that too. Okay. You could make it a six-step if you want and add, you know, keys, possession, right? As, as a different thing. What I'm saying is when you look at the five-step home buying process, you can customize it and make it your own. All right. You guys all have the ability to do that. And the other thing is, is, you know, VIP, a lot of people don't really know what a VIP system is. I mean, a VIP system is whatever the hell you want to wrap in a bow and make it your own. Right. So I've just made it where we give you the access to the realtor's computer system. That's kind of important, right? Nobody uses that word realtor's computer system, but yet realtors have access to all the homes. So that's why I use the word realtor's computer system, right? We give you access to the realtor's computer system. You know, we take down your very specific home buying criteria and that way you get, you're guaranteed access to properties that match exactly what you're looking for literally as they become available. So you can weed out the competition be first to the property. So what I'm doing is I'm just solving somebody's problem. And no surprise, this VIP system was, I, I it didn't invent the word VIP system, but I implemented it in like 2005. And in 2005, six and seven, the market was really hot. Everybody was buying properties. And so I wanted to give them priority access to properties match what they're looking for as as they become available so they can weed out the competition. But as the market changed in 2008, um, you know, we went into the Great Recession, my VIP buyer system changed too, to where we would give you priority access to bank-owned homes, to stress sales, short sale homes. Why? Because that's when people were not urgent to buy. They were looking for a deal. They were price shopping. That's what buyers were doing. And so what I'm saying for you guys is just understanding that, you know, a VIP buyer system can be whatever you want it to be. It just has to be consistent for yourself and it can change if the market changes. And so while we give you a good framework for this, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can't go and, and change, you know, change these things to make them your own. This is all coaching for you, right? So you can change it and make it your own. I just find people that I've coached in the past prefer to have you know, well, show me what you do. <laughs> and then I can work on that and then become, you know, get better and then do my own thing. And that's just normal, right? All, I mean, even my coaching clients that were closing over a thousand homes a year would ask me for, well, what do you do? Like, what's your thing? Let me look at that. So I'm showing you my thing. This is what I did, you know? And then I'm just saying, once you've done this to a point, you can make it your own, make it feel like like Dalton, make it feel like Jamie, make it feel like you make it. Actually, I'm sure this one already feels like Jamie because Jamie, every time you do this, you get a freaking buyer broker sign. So you're, you're good at this girl. <laughs> My jam. Yes, I know. That's Jamie's jam right there. <laughs> yep. So you just practice this too. It wasn't that you were just attending the trainings, Jamie, right? What, what would you do? You, you would find other people and you'd be like, Hey, I want to role play this with you. Will you do it? Right. And you've been doing that for, I mean, for like months, you were role-playing this thing. And am I right? Yes, sir. You are right. Yeah. And so it's no surprise now that this, not only, you know, if you're presenting to a buyer, they're going to sign the paperwork with you just because you follow the process. But I think also the way that it helps you talk to buyers now on the phone has changed. You have a lot more confidence and you have a lot more specific information that benefits them. And it makes it easier for them to raise their hand and say, yeah, I'll come and meet with you. Right? Absolutely. Okay. So you're, I'm just having you kind of answer those because, you know, eight months ago you were Dalton Clark, you know, you're like, what buyer presentation? Like I never really even thought about a buyer presentation. I just go meet buyers at properties, you know? So I'm just, I'm proud of the fact that you've been able to shift the mindset. You've been on the trainings, but then you've practiced th these things. And now all the buyers that you've met with, I don't know what you have, like 14 or 15 buyer broker agreements signed. I mean, you're shooting basically as close to hundred percent as, as you need to be, you know? All right. Yeah, so like, um, like you said the other day, and it's actually on my vision board, don't practice until you get it right. Practice until you can't get it wrong. Damn. I love that. Yeah, that I is really good. love that. Yeah, that's great. And I find when I stick to this script, that's when it, the magic happens. 
Yeah. And it's just a matter like none, none of us really want to sound scripted, but scripts are there to memorize and then internalize. And once you've internalized them, then you can personalize them and make it sound like Jamie. You know what I mean? Make yeah. it sound like Dave, make it sound like Dalton or make it sound like Janet, but don't make it sound like Audrey. One of some, like you told me, Josh, like you got to have a lot of at bats and I just had a lot of at bats. Oh, yeah. I'm striking out. Yeah. Fail your way forward, right? Yep. Okay. So, you know, the goal is to set in office um, meetings with buyers. We use buyer mofers for doing that. There's a number of them that we've worked through. One of the ones that, you know, I love right now is the backup offer script, right? Just, you know, hey, let's go out and take a look at the property. There's probably an offer that's on the property. No big deal because 31% of offers that are accepted between a buyer and seller right now in Utah are failing. And so anybody in here um, listed a property that's uh, failed a sale in the last year besides me? Did that property fail more than one sale? Did anybody have one of those besides me? No. Okay. So all I'm saying is, you know, this is a reality guys, you know, offers that are accepted between buyer and seller will fail. You know, that's why as a seller, you're always trying to get a backup offer just in case the primary falls apart. All right. We've seen a lot of that this year, much higher than the national average as a result of the interest rates moving up and buyers get cold feet, right? They're not walked through a presentation like you guys are going to do with the buyers. Having a presentation like this for buyers helps you overcome objections before they ever become objections because you're setting expectation as to what's going to happen throughout the entire process, right? So um, I love using that uh, backup offer Mofer script. I don't know, Dave, if you want to throw that back in the kitty, the queue. I know that you guys have really practiced hard on the VIP, which is bitching, but consider adding that backup offer Mofer script in there. So the first thing that we do when we meet the buyer in office is we want mm -hmm. to just kind of go through an icebreaker. Um, there's an acronym for it, which is Family Occupation Recreation Dreams Ford. Some people like frog, which is family recreation, occupation goals. You know, um, it, this is there if you're just not used to asking questions. I don't follow Ford specifically anymore because I can cover all of that in a conversational format. But remember, I've done it many hundreds of times. And so it's just memorized. So all of this just kind of comes out in a conversational format. Jimmy, I'm sure you're doing the same thing when you're meeting with buyers too, just getting to know them a little bit when they come in, right? Absolutely. A asking questions about build that. Mm -hmm. yeah. building that rapport, finding out, tying a bat, that's gaining their trust and uh, creating a relationship with them. Yeah. Um, so what you said is really important because people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So the whole point of having a Ford or this icebreaker conversation is to use one mouth and two ears proportionately. You ask questions and let them talk. By, by love, people love to talk about themselves by allowing them to do that. You're actually building trust and that helps you gain, you know, the driver's seat through the conversation. Right. So um, you, after, after you're done kind of with that icebreaker conversation, you're going to let them know what to expect uh, with today's appointment. So after we kind of wrap up that uh, conversation and be like, cool, Jamie Dixon, that's awesome. Um, so, Hey, here's what I want to make sure that we get covered today. Okay. I want to walk you through that five step home buying process. Um, we're going to do some fun stuff and get you set up on that VIP buyer system. Um, and then I'm going to walk you through the paperwork that's associated with um, buying a property here in Utah. After that, we can actually take a look at the market and just kind of visit some properties that maybe have sold. So you can kind of get an expectation of what properties like you would want are actually selling for. And then uh, I'm going to send you guys a link to the Realtors computer system. When you guys get home tonight, we make sure to accept that link. And then also, Jamie, can we go ahead and just get our dating day scheduled right now? Um, I could do it Absolutely. Thursday. I could do it on Saturday morning. What, what What's best for you, Jamie? Oh, Thursday sounds great. Jamie's probably going to be like, what's a dating day? Um, that's Those are the only dates I go on lately. I told my clients, these are my dates. So <laughs> I actually enjoy them. I'm dating again. <laughs> that's so, hilarious. That's, that's a win, right? Memorize, internalize, and there, my friend, is personalize. That's so good. Um, I love dating days. 
Yeah, people don't really know what dating day is. So I throw it out there and kind of like chuckle and just wait a second. They're like, what do you mean? <laughs> like, well, you know, I mean, it's not like we're going to go out and look at the first property and, and marry it, although that can happen. So I just call this dating day is just kind of going out and getting a baseline of what's available, right? So looking at maybe your top three properties that I'm going to send over to you. So I could do that Thursday or Saturday morning best for you. Josh, I have a question on that. Yes, ma'am. Is it too soon to ever do a dating day? Like if they're not qualified yet, or you don't know, or you don't know, like, what do you want to do before you take them out? Like, or is there some like stipulation, you know, standards they have should be, should be at? Well, the very first step of the first time or the five-step home buying process is getting that approval. And so, yeah, I won't go out and actually show them the properties until they have their approval, but we talk about that during the five step. Now, if they're not approvable, which has happened like, you know, numerous times to me, like, especially during the great recession, like when like nobody could qualify for a loan because loans were basically non-existent. Um, you know, I would just put it on pause. I'd still schedule the dating day, right? It goes in the calendar. Why? Because I have to direct the conversation and move the entire process forward. So we get the paperwork signed where everything's going to be good. But some of those folks are not going to qualify for a loan and some of them qualify for a lot less than the house that they would want to buy and so those are people that will just cancel the dating day on but you know those are people that i'll service on a weekly basis at least up front until they go into my eight by eight and 36 touch and so i have a weekly servicing day you know and it was always on wednesday you service all everybody you have a listing with and guess what a buyer broker agreement is a listing just calling to check in, see how you're doing. Nothing new's really come up in the price range, but I wanted to let you know that I am looking everywhere, including all those wholesale properties, just to see if anything shows up that's a good deal that we could actually get ourselves into. By the way, I don't think you really considered Ogden, but there were a handful of properties that have popped up in the last week that were under 250000 that I would definitely live in. What are your thoughts? It's about a 45 minute drive, right? So by, by servicing, I can start pushing the needle forward, opening the envelope. People know that I'm, I'm paying attention and caring and that can change things. More importantly, if I'm servicing these people, well, not only am I developing that, that, um, you know, relationship of trust, but also what happens is if they have people that they run into that are thinking about buying a home, what do they end up doing? They refer you. And that's what I want. Even if you can't buy a home, you'll refer me to somebody eventually that can. And if I've got 10 people that can't buy a home, at least one of them is going to end up referring me. Actually, <laughs> probably two. Yeah, go ahead. That's my, uh, <clears throat> on the flip side, on the seller side, that's my favorite thing to say. Hey, even if you end up finding the buyer on your own and you pay me 0% commission, you'll, if I give you the great service that you uh, would appreciate, you'll probably refer me somebody down the road. So that's why we offer that. How cool is that, man? Yeah, that's great. Great way to to turn that, right? So, so what do we have here? So today I want to kind of walk through that five-step home buying process in the VIP system, right? So now we understand, have a better idea of what the safe island looks like, but now I'm going to go straight to our presentation. We're going to move right to the five-step home buying process. All right. And so, and then number one is kind of what Jamie was talking about. That is obtain your golden ticket. So I'll just, I'll play like uh, Jamie and Dalton are, are basically my clients here. So the very first thing that we want to make sure that we do is get a golden ticket, Dalton, Jamie. Now the golden ticket, just so you guys are aware, is not a pre-approval letter necessarily. It's actually a full approval letter. So it's where the lender takes all of your financing information, enters it into what's called an automated underwriting system to the point that we actually get issued an approval. And that approval is only only based on getting a real estate purchase contract and an appraisal in. The benefit of having that versus just a pre-approval letter, having a full approval letter or our golden ticket is that it turns you into a cash buyer in the eyes of the seller. Now, have you guys already spoken with a lender yet? I'm just curious. Most, uh, most of the yeah, time people yeah. say, yeah, I mean, my bank. Yeah, cool. Who do you bank with? Yeah, my bank. We talk to our bank. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Who, who's your banker? Mountain America. Mountain America. Yeah. They do mm -hmm. offer some really good programs out there. I think they even have a hundred percent finance program um, for their members as well. Um, now here's the thing. I ultimately, Jamie, I don't care who you use for financing, but if you're okay with it, I'm going to have my lender give you a call because you may be able to save thousands of dollars on a loan before you ever go out and buy a house. And you seem like a smart person that likes to shop these things, right? All right. So Gosh, you know it. Cool. So her name's Mandy or her name's Brant or her name's Michael or his name's Michael, whatever. Um, I'll have them give you a call. Um, 
you know, I'll, I'll, as soon as we're done today, I'll reach out and touch bases with them and have them give you a call. And so a lot of this stuff you can do online or over the phone and it's no skin off of my back to, to help you guys out with this. Okay. So that's step number one. And that's obviously that'll help us uh, with, you know, number two, and that's our VIP home buying system. So we have a better idea of where we can be based upon price range in Jamie and Dalton. Normally I find that you guys end up qualifying for more home than you actually want to buy. And so it's important that I get a pretty good idea from the lender where we want the payments to be, because that helps me determine where you guys' kind of upper limit is on the price range, right? So we'll get into that VIP uh, home buying system here in just a moment, but it's so cool, man. It's such a time saver. In fact, it's so specific that most of my clients only end up looking at between two and six homes before they actually purchase a property. So it's a huge time saver for you guys, not just getting priority access. So you stop losing out on these properties like we talked about before we met, but you you now will also have to look at fewer homes to find the right one. I mean, we just worked with a client that was like you guys, her name was uh, Sashi Nordfeld, and she had been doing this on her own for almost a year, literally. And almost every single property she was calling on was under contract. And a friend of hers happens to be a friend of mine. Her name's Mary Hatch. And she referred Sashi over to me. And so Sashi was very doubtful when we met with her that we could actually, you know, get her in. It was the third home that we looked at and it took us about a week. So after doing this for a whole year on her own, we were able to get her in a home within about a week. So it'll work for you guys too. Now I'm going to pause, go off script. The reason why I like to share that type of story um, is because it's a story of how I've helped other people with the same property. Now, that story is actually a true story. Now, if you don't have your own story, you can use Sashi's story because that's a true story that just happened. All right. So, you know, if she was looking for a house about a year, friend referred her over to us. Um, you know, we sat down, met with her doing the same thing that we're doing right now, got her set up on that VIP system, told her that she'd probably only have to look at between two, two to six homes. She did not believe us. It was the third home that we looked at that we put under contract and she closed just a few weeks ago. So she's moved in. I look forward to doing this for you guys. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. <clears throat> so the next step really is, you know, we'll go out on a dating day and, um, you know, we'll look at some 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 properties that kind of meet your needs. Now, when we do that, um, it's important for for us to um, carry around like a checkbook or or something like that. Do you guys write checks, by the way? Do you guys still write checks? Do you have a check? We don't know. No, you don't have a check. Okay, that's fine. <clears throat> We've got an app that we can use that'll collect earnest money. Um, because in order for us to have equitable title to a contract in the state of Utah, we have to actually have what's called earnest money. I'm sure you've heard of it, but do you know what it is? Um, no, what's that? Um, earnest money is essentially telling the seller, I'm earnest about following all of the guidelines of the contract. Now, when we write an offer on a property, Jamie and Dalton, we will make that offer contingent upon certain things like an inspection and appraisal and finance and seller's disclosures, et cetera. So if something shows up that, you know, is like, oh my God, we didn't know that. We can always cancel, retain our earnest money. But the seller sees earnest money as being sincere about following the rules of the contract. So honestly, especially in a multiple offer situation, the more earnest money, the better. I mean, if we're doing a down payment of 5%, let's go ahead and put all 5% down as earnest money because that money will belong to you. And to, as long as we're following the rules of the contract, which is yours and my job to do, um, then we get to the settlement table and that money is credited back to you towards closing costs or down payment. Okay. That's basically what earnest money is. Now I asked the checkbook question because if they have uh, checkbook, I just ask them to bring a check to our first showing, right? Just make sure you have one in the glove compartment, right? And if they don't write checks, because that's getting, that's an assumptive close, right? That's getting them to agree to do something, assuming that we're working together. And if they don't have that, then I'll say, no problem. We have an earnest money app that you can actually just wire direct from your account. It's pretty cheap. It's like 15 bucks, you know? So, and then I go on to explain what the earnest money is, right? So we're going to select homes that are going to match your criteria. We've got our dating day scheduled. Now, don't be surprised, you guys, if the first home we walk into is the right home for you. All right. I'm going to try really hard 
not to show you the best home first, but sometimes it happens. And so I want you guys to put your investor cap on. An investor is not afraid to tie up a property, to lock out all of the competition, to make sure that nobody else can take that property from you. Now, it doesn't stop you from looking at some other properties if that's what you want to do. But what it does is it guarantees us a certain frame of time that we can conduct due diligence. If we find a better property, that's fine. We can offer on it and cancel this one, assuming we can get the other one accepted. But you want to tie up the competition, right? You don't want them coming and getting any more of your houses. This has happened enough, hasn't it? All right. Yeah. Hey, All right. May I ask a question? All sure right. you can. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we've been running into, including myself, uh, we're, we're doing so well that we're actually putting like two properties potentially under contract at some points. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a way to alleviate that from not happening in the future? I Make think... sure you don't get jammed up. Well, yeah, yeah the this really didn't happen to me very often. I think it happens if we're not being efficient with our five-step home buying process. So it depends on how we've done the presentation with the clients to set the expectations. If we haven't set proper expectations, sometimes clients will go gun happy and just try to get one and then try to get another one and then try to get another one and try to get a best deal. But that mostly happens because we haven't set proper expectations. So what would be proper expectations? Um, the next house that you buy is what price range? What price range? 800,000. Okay. And then this would be the third home maybe that you've owned, right? So if it's 800,000, it's the third home that you've owned and you're looking out and say West Valley City, 800,000 is going to buy you a hell of a lot of house out there, isn't it? Right. Yeah. Now, how's $800,000 going to do out in Draper? Uh, mediocre. Pretty mediocre, right? So you have to know the market. So if it's West Valley that we're looking, they've got 800 grand to spend. You know, odds are if we created a top 10 must have list in a property, you're probably going to get seven or eight of those. Now, 800,000 in Draper, you know, odds are we create a top 10 must have list in a property. You're probably going to get about five of those items in this property. No, no big deal because it's not your retirement home, it's just a stepping stone to your next investment. Right. And so once you've, you know, found these four or five or six items, whatever it is, it's a lot like finding the keys in your pocket. You can stop looking, you know, they're there. And it just doesn't get better than that. And that's setting up the proper expectations to prevent people from just going, you know, cr cr crazy. It, it starts with setting expectations. Here's a top 10 list. And here's what you can expect to find in that top 10 list. And once you find it, it's like finding the keys in your pocket. You can stop looking. And so I'd have clients where I just create the top 10 list and put it on the back of the MLS printout. And I would just check it off, you know, for them. Right. Now I did have the opposite problem once with clients that couldn't make up their mind on a property, right? This is when you had 18 months of inventory. So you guys don't have that issue right now, but they just couldn't make up their mind. They wouldn't write an offer on anything. And I said, okay, guys, pick your top three properties that we've seen so far. And they picked their top three. And I went to look to see if they're available. All three of them have to happen to be still available, right? I said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to write an offer on all three of them. And we're going to see what, what the best deal we can get is. And we'll go with the one that's the best deal. If we get one that, you know, more than one that accepts our, our offer, then we can always cancel subject to inspection, right? Because they're flexible that way. So, but if you're having a problem where people are like, well, I don't know, man, is this best? So there's another one that just came on market and, you know, is that one the best one? And I don't know, do we need to get another one? It's like, that's where you have to go back and say, look, guys, let's just focus on our top 10 list. Remember, you're going to find five, maybe six of these items, depending on the price range and area that they're looking, you know, and once you find them, it's going to be a lot like finding the keys in your pocket. Once you know they're there, you stop looking. Does that help answer the question, Dave? Yes, it does. Thank you. Sorry. A little pause for the cause. It's All like right. finding your Birkenstocks under the sofa. I was just going to say with that, Josh, what you're just talking about, that's what I've been doing because people, like these last clients I had were all over the place. And so I just took them back to that top 10 list. Good for you. And stuck with that because I'm like, hey, we are not doing this. I'm like, this one checks this, this, this. And I just went through everything. Yeah. This really helps to narrow them down. Um, yeah, that's that decision. 
it's a brilliant tool to use. You know, that's why we like to use it, right? We use it for a, a number of different things. We use it to keep our people engaged um, to create a sticky appointment, right? We use it to make sure that we're not going to look at 100 homes before we write an offer. We use it to make sure that they understand when they get a good deal that it matches five or six of these items. And so we don't need to keep looking because it's like finding the keys in your pocket. So it has a lot of different uses. That's why we always come back to that, right? You know who taught me that one? No. Your mom? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she the general. Yeah, she taught me that one years ago, you know, and right. I was like, oh, that's so clever because, you know, when Marty. the market, you know, began to adjust, man, we had so many freaking properties to look at. It was just unreal, you know? Um, yeah. It's like hard to explain for people who weren't in real estate, but to imagine 18 months of homes on the market, it's like, dude, don't worry. The best property is not probably going to sell tomorrow. <laughs> so you don't have to freak out. All right. So <clears throat> once we find the right property, you know, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and make an offer on that property. Again, we make the offer contingent upon certain things happening, and I'm going to go through those with you. But um, we've got the earnest money, right? We've got the offer. We've got the, the golden ticket. We send it all in. Um, listing agent calls us back and says, guess what? Sellers accepted your offer. We are under contract. Now, you know what we're going to do? We're going to do the woot woot, Nance. Whoop, whoop. Yeah, that's it, man. It's so awesome to finally get to that point where somebody's accepted an offer. But you know what's going to happen, Dalton, Jamie? You guys are going to wake up at like two o'clock that morning with the cold sweats going, oh my God, what did I just do? All right. So when you leave here today, I want you to stop by the old convenience store, buy yourself a package of Tic Tacs, those little things that look like pills. I want you to take two of them and then call me in the morning, all right? Now, if you're a human being, you're gonna do the woo-woo dance and then you're gonna freak out. If you're not human, you won't. But basically every single time up until Sashi, and that's no lie, um, everybody did the, oh my God, what am I doing? And they, they go crazy, right? And that's what I'm doing off script right now, agents. What I'm doing is I'm setting the expectation that they're gonna freak out and that's normal. Freaking out is normal. Right now, I don't know about you guys, but I've bought a lot of homes and there isn't a single home that I haven't bought where I didn't or that I bought that I didn't freak out on. I freaked out on every one of them, you know, not like gangbusters or anything, but we call it the cold sweats, not buyer's remorse. I just want you to understand there's a difference between the two. And if they start listening to me, they'll stop listening to other people. And that's what I need them to do. Well, it really is normal to have those emotions and those feelings. That's absolutely it is, an experience. It's not all just happy and positive, unfortunately. That's why they call us real estate therapists. You yes. Know, because our clients are freaking oh, out yeah. all the time. You know what I mean? Only a therapist, hand holder. <laughs> and one in 50 is going to be just a total head case. I mean, just an absolute freaking nightmare to deal with. It's a, like a one in 50 deal. So 2% of the properties that you sell, you're going to be dealing with wackos. Um, just know it's true. All right. When you lead generate, you don't have to lead tolerate. Uh, my dog has something to say about that. Kai, leave it, buddy. Come here. Somebody's at the door, I'm pretty sure. Doesn't happen a lot in Alaska, but it's happening. Anyway, um, and so <laughs> the other the other person in Alaska is at the door. Yeah, the other one. <laughs> they showed up. Sorry, I'm gonna bring them into the party. Maybe they want yeah. to be on this stuff. Maybe they'll pick up something. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Um, so I've set, set this expectation, right? This is another reason why we're doing these types of presentations. So we can set the expectation. So when I have a client that just wants to keep looking at properties and I talk about the top 10 list, I said, remember, I told you, you're just going to get a little nutso, um, <laughs> when we go under contract. So you just, what you're doing right now is totally normal. That's what most of my clients do. They just want to keep looking at properties. I get it. No problem. So we'll go ahead and take it to the next step. So the, the next step in the real estate, you know, once we're in a contract, the very first thing we want to do is we want to review what are called seller's disclosures. So if we look at section seven of the real estate purchase contract, which I like to put in their buyer packet, right? Just a copy, of, a blank copy of the real estate purchase contract so I can reference it. Um, and, and I just go over section seven. So I let them know here are all the things that we can expect to see from a seller's disclosures. And I like seeing that. So if we have questions about CCNRs or HOA or special assessments, or you know, if the seller had disclosed some things on a property, it gives us an opportunity to get this over to the home inspector before they actually go out and do the inspection. So they have the same information we have and can pay really close attention to some of those items. All right. 
Um, at the same time, my team and I are going to um, order a preliminary title report, and, and we're going to look at the uh, property description to make sure there aren't any weird easements running through. That's you guys, agents. You need to read the freaking property description, right? If your clients are going to build a shed or build a garage, and there's an underground easement, um, and you sell them the house, I feel like that's your fault. Like the only thing you need to do is pay attention to any red flags on, on a, a title report, you know, and um, read the property description. It's not hard to do. It takes about a minute. Um, but those are your responsibility. And those, that's my responsibilities. I'll read through the property description, make sure there aren't any uh, weird easements that we need to know about um, or anything odd. And then we'll look at making sure there aren't any liens against the property that would prevent you from uh, getting what's called fee simple title or just a real clean title to the property. All right. Um, after that, what we're going to do, and that's that usually takes us maybe three days or so to get all the property disclosure information and review it. All right. And then after that, we're, um, you know, going to look at getting a home inspection. So a home inspection is a have, Let me ask you a question real quick, Dalton, Jamie. Have you guys ever bought a used car and then took that car maybe to a mechanic or bought it from a shop that had like a 150 point checklist before you actually bought it? Right. Well, this is yeah. kind of what we're doing, except, you know, cars are like $30,000 and houses are like a half a million, <laughs> you know, so we want to have a qualified mechanic come out to the property and take a good hard look at that home, and make sure everything is functioning for its intended purpose. And so um, I've seen literally hundreds, if not thousands at this point of home inspections, and every one of them comes back, you know, kind of a Bible sized list of honeydews, right? Honeydews are just your trips to Home Depot, right? They're the little things that you have to do because home inspectors like to inspect a property to code. And if you're looking at a home that was built in 1970, it won't be built to code. All right. So you get a bunch of little things that show up. Now, what we look for on an inspection, Dalton and Jamie, are major deferred maintenance items, safety concerns or systems failures, all right? Major um, safety or major uh, deferred maintenance items, systems concerns, you know, uh, systems failures, right, rather, and safety concerns. I said it right the first time. So those are the three things that we look at. Now, in the event that we find any of those things, we can negotiate with the seller to see if we can't get some sort of credit or get them to take care of some of the bigger things you know, that we may see, right? Um, it's real common for us to see home inspectors say, well, this hot water heater is past its life expectancy. And at that point, I usually will say it's still functioning for its intended purpose and it might last another 15 years. We have no idea. So those are the things that we avoid asking for um, in inspections, right? Right? But if it's something that's not currently working or they've got, you know, exposed electrical in places that they should or crappy plumbing, then we want to make sure we address those things. Now, typically, depending if we're in a multiple offer situation or not, typically we'll have seven to, you know, 10 days or so to conduct those inspections, right? And the good news is for you guys, I can get an inspector out there within 48 hours, you know. All right, cool. So after uh, we get through the inspection process, assuming we didn't have anything that we needed to write up, or if we did, we got it resolved in writing within that time frame where the seller agreed to take care of our concerns. Now we're moving forward to the next step, which is the finance and appraisal process. So the good news is you guys are going to have your golden ticket, uh, which means you're pretty much fully approved by the time you purchase this thing. But in the event that the lender asks for any updated information, I want you to give it to them Amazon yesterday. You remember back in the day when you could, uh, you know, Amazon was just a subscription account and you could guarantee you free shipping that would take like two weeks. And now it's turned into all I need to do is think about it and Amazon delivers it. Okay, that's the kind of mentality that you have to have now with getting documents to lenders, right? So, and sometimes they ask you for the same document twice, just give it to them twice, all right? Um, that way we don't delay anything on their side because they're going to be working hard to get all of this stuff through underwriting. And then, of course, the other thing we have to do is make sure that the appraisal is going to be issued. So if you guys end up using Mountain America Credit Union, I need you guys to immediately give them authorization to use your credit card to um, deploy an appraiser when that time comes. You can give them the the credit card information, you know, tomorrow, what is it today? Today's Tuesday, tomorrow's Wednesday, right? Go ahead and just grab your calendar, give Mountain America my credit card info. They won't charge you until an appraisal is ordered, just so you know. An appraisal is going to cost between five and $600. Now, our lender will cover the appraisal for you, but then they collect for that appraisal at settlement. So you don't have to give them a credit card, 
Uh, but Mountain America will require that. I just want you to be aware of that. Now, in multiple offer situations, oftentimes pro uh, property values can go above list price. And so we really have to make sure that we can get the property to appraise um, or you guys not be obligated to purchase that property. So we put that financing and appraisal contingency out usually 14 to 17 days to give us enough time to get the inspection done. Because if there are issues with that, we can't resolve. I don't want you guys paying for an appraisal. Right. But that should give the lender plenty enough time to order the appraisal, get all the financing stuff done as long as you do your part. And that's called Amazon yesterday. Are we good with this? All right. Nice job, guys. All right. And during this process, I'm going to give a copy of your contract over to Utah Home and Auto so they can quote you some uh, home insurance. Who do you guys use right now for your auto insurance? Bear River. Bear River, sweet. So when we go into contract, I want you to call up Bear River since they already have your automobile insurance and just give them the property address and give you a quote on that and see what their coverage is and what it's going to cost. And then when Utah Home and Auto, Chris, I think um, will give you a call. When he gives you a call, just give him your automobile insurance stuff because when you bundle, you end up saving money. That's how the, the lizard says we can save you 15% or more because <laughs> it's all on bundling, right? Uh, a lot of people don't know that. So make sure that you get two quotes and one of them I'll help you get and the other one you guys are responsible for getting. Is that cool? Yeah. Cool. All right. And then the next step. So like once we get through all of that, it's like, we get to go to the settlement table. We get to go and do, you know, go to the title company, do a bunch of risk, risk calisthenics, right? You know, the alphabet like this, because you're going to be signing paperwork for like 45 minutes to an hour. You know, we don't want you guys to get carpal tunnel. So we'll get you all worked out before we start signing all those documents. It's called settlement. And then after settlement, we get closing. Now in Utah, for whatever reason, we like to call everything closing. Closing, just so you understand, is when the property funds and records in your name, meaning that the sellers have received the money from the title company that you've your bank has wired over to them along with your down payment. Okay. They've received all that and they've recorded it in the county records. So now the deed is in your name or the title's in your name. And then after that, it it'll fund and record. And that's closing. That's when typically if the property were vacant at Closing is when you would take possession of the property, but sometimes, you know, a seller still lives in a property and depending on whether or not they need a little bit of time to move out, will determine what, when we take possession. So that's on 3.3 of the real estate purchase contract. And again, this is why I like to have the rep C behind the, the um, buyer presentation. So I can constantly keep referencing that, right? So I'll just pull up section 3.3 be like, this is where we talk about when we take possession. And I give them different scenarios. Like I just gave to you guys, like if the property is vacant, odds are we'll be able to just take possession as soon as it funds and records. Now, most sellers, you know, will need a day or two to move out after funding and recording because they need their money. But sometimes sellers need a little bit more time than that. We'll find out what their seller's needs are once we've written an offer on a property. Again, I'm setting expectations right now as to what could happen. Because if I tell them they just take possession of the property once it funds and records, you know, what happens if we're in a multiple offer situation and we need to give the seller, you know, 30 day rent back to be able to get out. Now, all of a sudden, my clients aren't very happy about the situation because they're like, well, we own the house. And it will be like, no, we talked about this up front. You know what I mean? So setting expectations is really all you're doing when you're going through this process is preventing objections from happening. Okay. Janet, do you have any experience where objections happen because we didn't maybe go over uh, like a presentation properly in your real estate career? Yeah. 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 Yes, it's happened. <laughs> yeah. Dave, has this happened to you ever as a result of not setting expectations up front? No, never. <clears throat> lies. All lies. Jamie, has this happened to you ever in your real estate career? Um, uh, no, but yes. Mm -hmm. Good answer. I'm telling you, man, like once I realized that most objections could be covered by covering th those objections in a presentation, they never become objections. And so you can see why the way that I do this is the way I've done this for years. But the reason why I do it is because they were all failures I had. People waking up with cold sweats, buyer's remorse, backing out of contracts. That started happening to me and I didn't know what to do. And so I started calling it the cold sweats and told people that it's normal and they're going to get it, 
right? Hey, and Josh. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I have a question about that. Yeah. I mean, you go over this. This is a, a great presentation. It takes some time. There's a lot of information that they have to intake. How do you bring them back around to remind them you already had that conversation? Do you remember when? <clears throat> and and I mean, I mean, is there a polite way to do it? <laughs> Well, it just depends on what part of the objection, you know, what, what objection they're giving us, right? <clears throat> so if it's an objection because we're out looking at other properties, it'd be like, now here's the top 10 list that we had created. Remember, this property matches not six, but actually seven of those, which is two more than we should get. So you're basically, you found yourself the best deal possible out there. And then you can also throw out the love it or leave it program. Hey, if you don't love this house in a year, now the love it or leave it program basically will just say, I guarantee I'll sell it for free on my side while I help you find a different house. You still have to pay the commission on the buyer side, but I'll sell it for free on my side while we find you another house. That's the love it or leave it. So that's just a good insurance. Hey, if you don't love this property after a year of being here, I'll sell it for free while we find you another house. Okay. How many times have I done that? Zero. No. The one time was the 0% commission. That happened once, but those guys referred me. Okay. So it, you don't have to worry about offering it. Now, if it's like something about inspections, you know, things like that, just remember, I, I just go back and remind them about the Bible size list of honeydews. That's why I give it such a, like a specific name, the Bible size list of honeydews, because it really sticks in your head. Remember the Bible size list of honeydews? Yeah. That's what you got. I have to teach some of them what a honeydew is. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I <laughs> like the way is. Hunter used to describe it when he was part of our high performance coaching group. He's like, they're trips to Home Depot. And yeah. that's pretty much <laughs> what they are, you know, trips to Home Depot. Right? I'm like, they're when this has to be fixed in your house, like, <laughs> you're like, honey, do this, honey, do that, honey, fix this. Yeah. I'm a little visual of it. So yeah, another different. one that I'll remind people of too when they're freaking out is like, you're acting totally normal. Don't even worry about it. Remember when I told you you're going to wake up in the middle of the night and have the cold sweats? I forgot to mention that a lot of people just have cold sweats until they get to the closing table. So my bad, but you are acting totally normal. This is normal. Let's carry on. So it's saying you're not freaking out. You know, you're just acting normal. Let's carry on. Okay. All right. They just need a guide at that point to tell them that the way that they're behaving is not unusual, that other people are freaking out like they would. So they don't feel like, you know what, that, that whole concept of misery enjoys company, right? They don't want to be the only ones misery. I mean, they're freaking out. They're like, I'm, I'm the only people that freak out. Something must be wrong with this process or wrong with me because this is not working. And you're like, no, actually, you're acting completely normal. All of my people freak out, including myself the last time I bought a house. Trust me, I was a wreck. I was a total wreck all the way to the closing table. Hell, I was a wreck a week after closing. Thank God I bought the house when I did though. Kind of sounds like me and my whole real estate journey. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. Right. Share the story, man. My whole real estate <laughs> career has been filled. That, that's a cold, sweat, the cold sweat. <laughs> Feeling like there's something wrong. Yeah. So then, you know, after it funds and records, we look at what our possession is. I get to do the most amazing thing in the world. And that is meet you guys out at the property, open up that key box and deliver keys. And that my friend is the American dream. And I am looking forward to taking you to the finish line. This is such a good investment of your time and money. You are so smart to be doing this right now. Boom. So smart, right? Remember I use the, that, that quite a bit as well. So now nah, I'm not gonna have enough time to go through the VIP. I do want to talk a little bit about the VIB because um, now, nah, maybe, well, no, I don't know. No, I'm going to talk about it a little bit right now. My primary thing with the VIP is is basically, um, you know, to set the stage that all my businesses referred to me. So I always ask them, even if I know now, who referred you to me? Oh, uh, it was Dave. Cool. Yeah, that's Dave. what I remember. It was Dave. Yeah, awesome. I just want to make sure I send him a thank you. Um, and this this is where I set up. Um, oh, actually, the the time frame. This is how I I do the time frame question. Is I say, okay, you guys, if you could wave the magic wand in the air and pick a date on the calendar, what date are you moving into your new house? So time frame is the wave the magic wand. All right, we do that in the selling side too, don't we, Dave? Yeah, if you could. Yeah, we sure do. Yeah. 
Um, preferred method of contact. This is really important as well, right? So it's not like I'm just collecting their information right now. I'm going to set expectations in the same process. So Dalton, um, Jamie, you guys probably have different ways of communicating. Do you guys like phone calls, text message, email? What's your thing? What's your jam? I like the phone. Phone Talk. call? Cool. I'm one cool. of those pesky millennials where I don't answer phone calls. And I okay. Text. text message? Yeah, right. All right, cool, man. So here's the deal. Uh, Dalton, I'm going to text you and I write this stuff down. Text Dalton first, you know. Uh, Jamie, I'll give you a call. Now, Jamie, if I end up leaving you a voicemail message, you're at work or something, I mean, what's a reasonable time frame for me to expect a call back? Oh, within an hour. A couple hours, okay. Um, same is true for me. I mean, if I'm in a meeting like I am right now with you guys, I'm not going to stop what I'm doing with you to answer a call. So if you end up leaving me a message during business hours, just know it'll take me a couple hours to get back to you. Now I do go home. I do have a family. And so if it's after seven o'clock, I like to shut her down, spend a little kid time, if you know what I mean. If we're under contract, you know, and there's something that urgent that comes up, don't worry. I'm there for you. You don't have to worry about it. Same thing with the weekends. I'll be there for you. All right. Um, so now what I've done with this is I've set the expectation if they call me and I don't answer that usually, you know, a couple hours to get the call back, right? What does this do? This protects your freaking time. So you're not constantly focused on urgent things that are cleverly disguised as important because what happens when you guys get a real estate client is you've stopped going to get more real estate clients. And so your like one looks of the like bold laws, do you teach people how to treat you kind of thing too? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And it keeps your business from looking like a heart rate monitor where you're servicing all your people because you're doing a couple of deals or whatever. And then, you know, 30 days later, you got nothing. And then you got to build that pipeline up again. And then you got a couple of deals and then you got nothing because all you're doing is spending your time servicing by protecting your time and scheduling, you know, or, or setting expectations if they call when to expect a call back. You know, what you're doing is allowing yourself to have those times where you need to do what? Lead generate, script practice, practice your presentation, lead follow-up, go on an appointment and get a contract because those are the only money-making activities that you can do in real estate. You know, personally, I like showing up five days a week, nine to 12 to talk to strangers on the phone for fun. Oh. <laughs> uh. Dude, I have never heard that. That cracked me up. <laughs> that was legitimate. Nice. Mm. Okay. And then typically during this process, I'm going to let them talk about, you know, kind of what they want in their house. And we may not know uh, price range quite yet, but hopefully we can kind of get an idea of what price range looks like. You know, if you guys were to get a loan right now for $500,000, do you have any idea what your house payment would be? Should we look at this together? Just to yes. get an idea, you know? So let's say people are going to do an FHA loan. Go over to tools over here. You've got a mortgage calculator. Let's say they're going to do an FHA loan. And so, you know, they're basically going to be putting about 490 grand on a $500,000 home, roughly. Go ahead. Jamie, did you raise your hand? No, I was just oh. doing, making my screen brighter. Oh, okay. I got you. I wasn't sure. This so little magic wand moment there. I'll go ahead and, and just put in, you know, the interest rate. I think right now you guys know what it is weekly, you know, assuming they have good credit, FHA is six and a half percent. You're at around 490,000 at the sale price. So this, uh, the cool thing about this is it'll estimate your property taxes and PMI and principal and interest. Here's what your monthly payment would be approximately total right? Principal interest, taxes, insurance, and private mortgage insurance. If I just want to look at principal and interest, that's right here. You know, that's this part. So that's what you want to, you know, make sure that you guys have an idea of what that looks like, because when you meet with buyers, they probably don't have any idea. So I, I would say, you know, if it's a first time home buyer, I'd be like, okay, you guys doing what payments? 3,000, 3,500 total, right? That'll get you into a $500,000 home. Yeah, that's about what, that's pretty much the max. Yeah, I know. Wow. Well, I was right. Yeah, but what happens when we call them back in a year and the interest rates back down to five and a half, right? What happens? <clears throat> we went from 33.66 to 3,051, 3, right? That's 10%. Remember, when the interest rates go up or down by 10%, your payment goes up or down by, or when interest rates go up or down by 1%, payments will go up or down by 10%, right? So that's, I just demonstrated to you, that's exactly what happened. And so that's, that's 
you'll call them up when the interest rates go down. That's why when you close on a buyer, you put the label buyer um, on them. You put them in a post-close plan for sure. If you don't have that, we've done trainings on it. If you haven't seen the training like Dalton, if you haven't seen it, let me know. I'll send it over to you. But um, you can actually put a post close. You could look up the post close plan inside of Command, and I think it was. Uh, I don't think it was Audrey that created. I think Audrey, did you create the post close plan in Command? Nod your head, yes or no, because I can't hear you. She said you okay. did. Um, yeah, so it would be under the author Eden Wardle, like the Garden of Eden. Eden Wardle, Dalton. I know you know Eden. <laughs> so she she would have authored that um, plan post close, but you put them in a post close plan so you stay in touch with them through that. After you know, Gary Keller accuses real estate agents of running away from their clients after closings. You guys got to run to your clients after closings, even if you think it's a difficult transaction. Stay in touch with them, stay in front of them, be the professional, because most of the referrals you're going to get will come after within 30 days after closing. And if you have them on a post closing plan, you're intentionally staying in touch with them systematically. Hey, you got any needs with the house? You guys still living in boxes? You know, you need a contract? What do you What do you need? What do you got? What do you got? Have you met any of your neighbors yet? You know. The, the scripts are a part of that post-close plan. They're in there. I give you all the scripts for that. But the other thing you'll do is if it's a buyer, you're going to label them buyer and you're going to label them the year that they closed. Why would I do that? Well, if interest rates go down at the end of 2024, anybody that I've worked with that has bought a home in 2023, I'm going to call up and be like, hey, Dalton, Jamie, interest rates they were at six and a half percent when you bought it. They're at five and a half percent. Right now is the time to refinance. It'll probably save you about 300 bucks off your monthly mortgage payment. Do you want me to give you Mandy's information, Mike's information, Brant's information? Yes, yes, and yes. Perfect, right? Of course. Now I'm just value add, just value add, right? The other reason why I like to put the year that they close in there is because at the end of the year, maybe I want to throw like a little client appreciation party for everybody that's referred me. So if you've referred me, Dalton, in, in my contact for you, I add the label referred and I add the year that you referred me. So 2023 is just a year, a, a tag in there that I use for either closed people or people that referred me. And then I'll do a little client appreciation party for all of those people that have that year uh, labeled next to them. Or I might just send out gratitude videos. Like when my business got too big, it was hard for me to do things personally. So I just send out individual gratitude videos on my text phone. <laughs> you know, November, hey, Dalton, Jamie, this is Josh. I was just thinking about all the things I had to be grateful for this time of year. And I just remember how much trust and confidence you put in me and allowing me to be your American dream representative and get you into your first home. And I can't tell you how much I'm grateful for that opportunity to work with you guys. I hope you're doing really, really well. I miss y'all. Hopefully they'll be able to chat or I'll see you soon. And then I'll send that individually to you guys, right? And then I'll do the next one as the next 2023 on there and be like, hey, Dave, it's uh, Josh with Keller Williams. Hey, man, I just wanted to know that this time of year, I think about all the things I'm grateful for. And I was just thinking about you and how um, grateful I am that you just put all of your trust and confidence in me, allow me to help you uh, sell your property there in Magna. I miss talking with you, I miss working with you, but I just wanted to say how grateful I am for you. Boom, send it out. Videos, right? So having that year in there, is going to be really important. It's going to be really important. In the post-close plan, it'll talk about that as well. All right. Any ahas that you guys want to share? Let's just go through it real quick. I'm going to stop uh, the share, share screen here and go right to you guys. Let's start with you, Dalton. Any ahas, any takeaways, any thoughts, any actionable steps that you think you can take? Any of those? Um. <clears throat> Uh, I, I need to work on selling with stories more. Um, okay. I know a lot and I can explain everything. Uh, but you're good at you're you're good at the stories side of things, and that's you know that's that's that wins, no question. Um, yeah, you can share my story too, and it's a we instead of I. Well. Sure. We're with fine because you're a part of the same coaching group right we're all part of the same that. thing yeah totally um but yeah there's a lot in it I, I need to go back and review my own buyer presentation uh against what you've got there and take the best of both worlds and, and make it my own right on dude right on and then what i want you to do then is print out your buyer presentation 
and then you'll have access to this recording. And so put some time in your schedule for later this week, not during lead gen time, to review this recording and your presentation and take notes on what you like or dislike. Perfect. So just get that in your calendar. Cool. Okay. Miss Jamie D, what you got? A um, couple things. I I like how I like how you go over the earnest money part, the equitable title interest, and that's them really just following the rules um, mm -hmm. and as a seller. And this post close thing really got me. I think that's important to stay in front of them. One of the things I've also been focusing on is where you said early and often contact. So I think this just kind of ties into that. Is just you don't want to just you know ghost them after you're done. You know when you stay in contact with them and yep. and as part of it is being grateful for them working with you and choosing you and putting their trust in you. Um, so I think that's important to get business and referrals. So. Those are a couple of my takeaways. Cool. And and you guys, even when you're in a difficult transaction, you, you feel like running away from your client. Like, I'm just cool not talking with them. Thank God we got to the finish line. Oh my God, that was a nightmare. Whatever it was to them, their experience was totally different. They're, they're really only going to end up remembering you as good. You know, so you have to take your head out of it and just be a system about it. I got my three day follow up, my 10 day follow up, my 30 day follow up, and my 45 day follow up. And I got the scripts and it's just a system. I'm going to do the same thing every single time. And when I do it, I get referrals. So good ahas, Jamie, Dave, any ahas from you? Uh, just two quick things. Thank you, Audrey, for making the seller cheat sheet because all of our RAS scripts and everything's in the seller cheat sheet. So if we ever get lost in the transaction, that'll outline it. Mm -hmm. And then also this refresh my memory on adopting a client. If I'm representing the seller on a listing and we close, I like to call the buyer of the property that purchased the property and call them and congratulate them and see if they have any questions about the house after they moved in. Nine times out of 10, the other agent hasn't even called them to congratulate them on the sale. Truly. Yeah, truly. Any Anything from you, Audrey, your perspective on operations? Not sure. Oh, it was working. It's not working. So important to kind of now like, it's working. Oh. Now it's working. So important with the different types of personality styles, um, just kind of catering to each person individually. And I'm excited for the disc class coming up in a few weeks with you to learn more about that. Yeah, two weeks from now, I'm going to do a disc training for you guys. And it's one I've done to, I've given the same type of training to the UAR leadership um, to the UAR, right? So this is all good stuff um, to learn. It'll. You guys all got a link uh, in that calendar invite, right? I think I sent it out via email too. Do yourselves a favor and make sure you take that. You don't need to turn a copy into me. That's not important, but it will be important for you to understand yourself and how you fit into the way that we're talking about others. So many of you guys may have already taken it. Thanks for bringing that up, Audrey. Yeah, July, July 5th. So which Janet Zimmerman should I ask who has ahas? She's going to have to have two ahas and two actionables. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so my ahas were I, honestly just because what I'm going through right now, just trying to figure out how to um, uh, balance how many homes I show and make sure that I keep my clients on task um, with the what they've told me that they want to look for instead of us looking at every blessed thing under the sun to preserve my time and my lead gen for my next deal. So I, I appreciated that. I also appreciate it very much going through um, all of those items, um, the five steps. And I mean, and I like that you said we can, you know, obviously make this our own, but going through those five steps and explaining them to each of those items to the client so that it keeps the questions down and keeps my time focused where it needs to be, not just with them, but with other clients that I have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Good. Those are really good ones. And you see, I mean, I talked about them in a number of different ways, but you can see how what we're doing is helping them to fully understand the process, set expectations, normalize certain behaviors, and that prevents objections. That's the whole point. We just don't want to deal with a bunch of, you know, silly objections. Normal objections, that's fine, but silly objections, it just gets, <laughs> it's crazy. All right, Mr. Nice Guy, what'd you get? Well, you just said it. It's you're, you're literally putting out those fires before they get, ever get started. So anytime you have a problem in a transaction, you probably could have gone back and covered it better at that meeting. Yeah. And that way they were prepared for it. So just you're just making your transaction flow smoother by, by doing this up front. Yeah, and it's okay, you guys. I've had clients that I've had to re-meet with 
not over the phone, but like re meet with because, you know, things have gone haywire. I've shown 30 properties or, you know, whatever, whatever the reason is. And I'll meet with somebody in person. I'll come back to that presentation and walk them through it again, you know? So, um, yeah, I appreciate that. Zach Opie, what'd you take away from this? Anything actionable that you're going to take action on, Mr. Opie? Um, I can't remember the exact saying you said, but basically I, my biggest takeaway was just when you said the heartbeat monitor or agents are like heartbeat monitors. So I, I'll have a bunch of deals going on and putting out a bunch of fires and trying to appease them and then, and then won't get back on it until that starts to dry up and then realize that I need to get back on it, I guess, where I need to just do a better job of setting aside each day a time to prospect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can see all the proof here. You bulletproof yourself from yourself when you protect that time and set those expectations. Do I sound so, yeah, like I said protecting protecting my time is probably the biggest takeaway? Wait. Did I lose you guys? No, it's me. Put put your on, on mute, Opie. Try that. Check, check. It's me. Okay. 30 minutes. Our grizzly bear there. Okay, 30 minutes. See you there, robot man. 